to, to have a conversation with each one of us about tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Last week we studied verse 1, 2, and the first half of verse 3. And tonight we will start with the second half of verse 3. So a quick summary, basically verses 1 and 2, he is greeting them. And then verse 3, he starts to talk about a topic. Uh, does anyone remember what that topic was? Faith. Yes, faith. And so we saw that he just can't stop thanking God for them. And he, in verse 3, he says, We are bound to thank God always for you. So all the time, giving thanks to God specifically for a group of people. And not just that, but also for a specific thing, brethren. And so he says, You guys are really dear to me, as it is fitting. And I, I would, it would be wrong of me not to give thanks to, to God for you. Why? Because of your faith. Not just that you talk about your faith, but you actually have faith. And your faith is not status quo. Your faith is not the same today as it was yesterday, but your faith grows, so it's always growing, but it doesn't just do that. It is a very amazing faith. It grows exceedingly. You guys are, are you just amazing, the way your faith is in your life. And we talked a little bit about faith, that faith, you know, you could read about it, but it doesn't do us much good. And when it actually comes to real life where our faith really develops, and again, faith can mean many different things, but here it's talking about trusting God in our lives. We could talk about trusting God, you could preach about trusting God, you could read about trusting God, but then really the way to trust God is we have to actually be put in a situation where we need to trust Him, and then our faith is really tested if it's genuine or not. And so we talked about faith is like a muscle. And the, in order for a muscle to be built and be strengthened, you need weights. And weights are the trials, the tribulations that we have in life. But actually, did, there's a way to measure faith. So have you ever thought, like, you know, if you walk to somebody, you can measure certain things, right? So there's this dreaded thing called a scale. You know, <laughs> and you can measure your weight on the scale. So, you know, if you go to the doctor's office, they always want to take your weight. And, you know, it's really, it's really funny. You should record this one time, you know, uh, to see what people do. They do really funny things, you know. So for the ladies, you know, they'll, they'll put their purse down and, you know, take off as many things as they can and so, because they want to be as close to the real weight as they are. Same thing with guys. They'll take out wallets and, and big gadgets from their, um, from their things, and then you're like, okay, that's my real weight. But there's no, like, faith scale that's like, ah, there you go. Here's, what it, here's your faith. But there's a way that you and I can kind of know, how is my faith? And that could be really measured in real life by my faithfulness to the Lord. So if I'm living faithfully to Him, then I'm living the life of faith. And that's one good measure that we should test ourselves tonight and say, Lord, how faithful am I to you? Not how cool do I look in front of people or how faithful do I look to people or how good of a Christian I seem to other people or how others perceive me, but really, how am I doing? Lord, in my life with you, in my walk with you, am I honoring you in my daily life? Am I honoring you in my walk? That's being faithful. And that means the only reason I would be able to do that is because I trust him and I have faith in him. So I really pray that God will help us, that we never just have faith, but that our faith grows but then that the Lord will take it to the next step, that it grows exceedingly. Next, let's come to the second topic, and that is love. And here the, the amazing thing is, here he's speaking to people of the Thessalonians who are suffering, and they were suffering a lot in the first epistle when he wrote them that one. And then Satan said that's not enough, so he made them suffer even more in the second epistle. And so, I don't know about you, but when you're suffering, do you start thinking about other people? Or what do we do? The normal human reaction, what do we do? <coughs> huh? Number one. And who's number one? Yeah, you, right? <laughs> you guys have to remember, Giselle is number one. No, I'm kidding. She, what she means is we, as the, as the people, we are number one. I mean, think of, think of this, okay? A real, real thing. Oh, raise your hand if you like the dentist. You were going to raise your hand, really? You like the dentist? Okay. Raise your hand if you like the doctor. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, then, you know, I, I'm a doctor, but I don't like dentists. My mom is a dentist. I'm scared of dentists. They have machines and things that can hurt you, and you're at their, at their uh, um, mercy. And you imagine, you know that tomorrow you're going to go and you're going to have an extraction of your wisdom tooth that is underneath the skin. So they have to d open, dig, and, and so you know that you have a tooth extraction tomorrow. It's not a simple one. Even a simple one is not good enough. What, do you, what, is, what is going through your mind? I mean, from a week before, you start feeling kind of depressed and down and sad. Afflictions of life and, you know, and things like that. And then the night before, you don't think about anybody. You don't want to talk to anybody. It's all about me. It's just me, man, okay? Just all I think of is me. But here he says, listen, guys, there's something really powerful in the Christian walk that can happen to us. We can be in the middle of the worst of situations and not think about ourselves, but be able to think of each other. And then that's why he brought love after he brought faith. Because faith, I'm in the middle of my trial, but I know I'm okay. Because God is taking care of me. So think of it, faith is this way. So it's going upward that I tap into the upward power of God and still my situation hasn't changed, still my troubles haven't changed, still my trial hasn't changed, but because I've tapped into power from above, I start to radiate around me. I start to go horizontal and I start to have love for other people around me. And that's he says what, exactly what happened to you guys. Your faith was amazing. It didn't just wasn't faith, it grew and it, it grew exceedingly. But also, and the love, and it was not like this like isolated one person love, but it was the love of every one of you. So every single believer at Thessalonia or Thessalonica had genuine, true, real love despite their unbelievable weight of trouble and trials they are going through. And the love of every one of you all abounds. You don't just have love, but you have love that abounds. It is crazy. It is ridiculous. It is really, really, really high. Abounds toward each other. And it's not like, oh, I have love. And you talk about love. And <laughs> there's people that kind of like, they talk about that stuff. It doesn't mean anything. They don't even know what they're talking about, what they love or what are they loving or what does that mean to love. But here they say, no, they have very specific, real love for believers, every single one for every other believer. Do you think they have differences? Yes, they do. Do you think that there is kind of like some issues that come in between them? Yes, they do. But they have their focus is on God and it's for the glory of God and they have that unity of God that they tapped into through faith. That's why they can love one another. In um, 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 1, verse 3, we've seen that Paul was giving thanks for them. He says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Uh, that was verse 2, verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So we've seen that their faith, there was work. It was not dead faith, but it was showed in real life. It can, you could see it in their lives. But not just that, labor of love. They didn't have love, but they had labor of love. That's the true measure of love. That is love in action is love, labor of love. Love is not easy. But also love is not just an emotion. It is an emotion, but it's not just an emotion. It's a command. And they realized that. And so they said, listen, we are here to stay. We are here as believers together to stay. It's not like, okay, who's number one? And then let's get rid of the people we don't get along with. He says, we're here to stay. And that's why I'm going to make it work. I'm going to do my part to make it work. And the other person says, I'm going to do my part to make it work. And that's why it's called labor of love. That is true love that God desires in the church. If you are coming to any church or if you go to any, even if you go into a relationship to be married, you need labor of love. Because there's going to be times where there's tension, where there's disagreement, where there's things like that. And it's so easy for Satan to say just, ah, oh, I want to quit. I want to walk away. I want to leave. You're lacking love. You've fallen into the trap of Satan, of allowing him to do his trick, the trial, the tribulation, 
the difficulties that you are going through. And then he showed the reality of you. Life, what life does to us is only what it finds in us. If under the pressure I say, I'm out of here, that's only because I'm a quitter at heart. It's not the pressure that made me quit. Labor of love. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul prayed for them and he said, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. Guys, I pray for you. And here's my specific prayer for you. I want you to have love, but no, not just love. I want you to increase. And then after you increase in love, I want you to abound. I want you to overflow. I want you to be spilling over everywhere. To abound in love to one another. I want you to love the believers in a very special way. With the pure love of God. that Love that, love that labors for each other. To one another and to all. But I want you to not just be stuck to just loving believers. I want you to go beyond that into the world, into unbelievers and people around you, because that's how you become contagious. That's how people will see that love and will want to have that relationship with Christ. It is not that debate that you can win, or because you're smarter than somebody, or you can go and get the most eloquent of other people who debate from the other side, whatever that is, and then you can go and, and, and embarrass them in front of people. That's not going to win anybody. But if you show the knowledge and share the truth with love, and you have sincere, true love, you're not there out to get them and embarrass them. That's what's effective. That's what matters. And he says, listen, don't just have love for one another. And I want you to not have any unique love. I want you to have the love that increases and abounds in love to one another and to all. And then he says, by the way, I didn't leave you hanging just as we do to you. I loved you that way, Paul says. But I'm not just me. So did Timothy. So did Silvanus or Silas. He showed you that love. You've seen love. Alive before you, and that's the love I want you to live toward others, believers and unbelievers. You've seen how people have mistreated us and how we've loved them. You've seen how believers have done things that are not love worthy and we've loved them. We've seen how people were really sinners out with spitefully wanting to hurt us, and you've seen the love that we've had for them. We have this love. So it's really important, guys, that we love, have the love. But the love needs to become real, real life, and alive. And we need to model it for each other so that people would know like, oh, yeah, when I go and I see him or her, that is Jesus loving people. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, he says, but concerning brotherly love, when it comes to that real, pure, genuine love, you have no need that I should write to you. I don't even need to write to you about it. I know I just prayed about it in the last chapter. But I don't even need me to write for you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. You learned from us. You've seen us love. And you've copied that. But you also have not just, you don't just look at people. But you also have a genuine relationship with God that is really intimate. That you've seen Him, you've experienced His love, and now you can model it and you can live that love. And that's why I can't really, I don't even need to write to you about it. And I wrote to you about this, this love. In um, Galatians chapter 5. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncom uncircumcision avails anything. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what rituals you do. It doesn't, it's not going to get you anywhere. It doesn't matter if you go to church. It doesn't matter if you say, I read the Bible. It doesn't matter how many times you've attended church. It doesn't matter, you know, how goody two shoes you are. It doesn't matter all these so-called measurable things that you can put. It doesn't matter. But here's what matters. Faith. A true relationship with God but not just that, working through love. You have faith. When you take faith, and faith is, I have faith that it gave me saving, that I received grace through faith. But then now I, that develops with me a faith and trusting God. When trusting God makes me want to serve God and want to serve people, 
But then he says, listen, there's a motive. There's something that's missing. And if I don't have it, that faith is not very helpful. And that is love. I need my motive when I serve each others. When I serve God needs to be with love. But faith working through love. That's, that's the juice, the power that makes me keep on living for God is love for God and love for the believers. Faith working through love. Back to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. How's our love? How are we doing with the sincerity of the love that we have? If I don't have love, or if I feel it's hard to love, maybe the next, I need to back up a little bit. And I say, well, where's my faith? Because without faith, I can't get to love. If my faith is not so good, Maybe I need to go to God and say, well, why is my faith not so good? And I can tell you what the answer is going to be. God is going to say, I want to develop your faith, but you won't accept anything that I allow in your life. You just complain about it. You don't want to build up your muscles. You're not happy about anything. So good luck having love if you don't have faith. But to have faith, you have to allow me to develop that faith in your life. May the Lord help us say, Lord, I want that faith. But I don't want just faith. I want that faith to work through love. And I want to be able to love the brethren. Verse 4. <clears throat> so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. And here we see that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, they just are bragging. They're boasting. And what are they boasting about? The Thessalonians the people of the Thessalonica. And it, what are they boasting about? I mean, what's there to boast about? He says, what's there to boast about? He says, let me tell you. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for you. And then here he specifies what it is that makes him so proud of them that he just can't stop talking about them and he boasts to everybody about them. For your patience and faith. Two things. You got patience and faith. And it's not like you just have patience and faith and you've got like... It's peaches, and it's nice, and there's no problems in your life. No, no. You have this in all your persecutions. So persecution number one, you have patience and faith. Number two, number ten, number hundred, whatever, how many. All of them, you have patience and faith. And oh, not just persecutions, and in all the tribulations as well. That you endure. And you endure these things. That's why I can boast about you, and I just can't stop bragging about you. What does this mean? When we live that life of patience and faith... When we live that life of faith and love, we actually become contagious and we become effective to people around us. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 4. Who comforts us? So, who is this? Let's go to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So here, he's talking about God, how awesome he is. And he is the God of all comfort. So comfort here doesn't mean like, you know, you go sleep uh, or, you know, like a, a mattress or something. No. Comfort means it's an encouragement. It's a feeling of uplifting. And this uplifting comes from God. And, and then it says here that he is not just God who gives comfort, but he's the God of all comfort. So meaning that if we really believe this and we truly have faith in God and the word of God and we believe that the word of God is the truth, is that there's no situation that you and I could ever be in that we can't receive comfort in because he's the God of all comfort. So whatever it is, here there's the God of comfort to meet you there. To give you that encouragement in that situation that you go through. So he says, so this God of comfort, when I discovered this about him, he says, here's what happened. Who comforts us? I actually tried him out. And he came through. And he comforted me. And then I tried him out once. And I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. So I tried him out again. And then I took it a third, to the third one. And the fourth one, I kept going. He says, who comforts us in all our tribulation. So then I said, you know what? 
You came through the first time, the second time, so Lord, any tribulation that comes my way, it's yours. I'm not going to face it alone because I know I'm going to fail. But you are the God of all comfort and you've comforted me. So I'm coming to you that you may comfort me in all my tribulations. And you actually did it. Who comforts us in all our tribulation. And then he says, I realized something. As I experienced God's comfort in these tribulations that I'm going through. Because have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about like why? Why is, it, why is there suffering? Right? Why is there so much sadness? Why is there violence? Why is there, right? If you ever meet an atheist, that's going to be the first question they ask you as a Christian, by the way. <laughs> they think they got you when they ask that question. Why, why, why? And it troubles people. And usually they've been hurt. They've had some bad things happen to them in life. So I really encourage you when you answer, answer in love. There's many reasons why suffering happens. That's not our topic for tonight. But Paul said sometimes, and he knows all the reasons. He says, sometimes I look at my life, and I look at my suffering, my tribulation that I'm going through right now, and I try to plug it into one of those. It doesn't fit. I say, okay, Maybe I've sinned. That's one reason to suffer, right? No, I didn't sin. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, maybe it's to test my faith. Remember Abraham? It says, and God tested Abraham. And he says, give me Isaac, your only beloved son whom you love, and put him on an altar. He says, I, I tested it. No, that's not it. He doesn't want to test my faith. And he started going and analyzing one after the other after the other. And he's like, there's really no reason. I really don't see any reason that is obvious to me why I'm going through what I'm going through. And he says, I praise God. He's comforting me through it because I trust him and I go through it. But I really don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through. And then the Lord says, boom. This is why I'm giving you this. And then when he realized that, he says, it is impossible for me to be upset now. And he says that there's really absolutely zero reason that I can figure out that God can reveal to me why I'm going through what I'm going through, but then I figured out what it is. It says that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. What? Yeah. What does that mean? Meaning God gave you this trial, not for any reason. If you go plug in any particular reason for trials, none of them fit. But he did it for one other reason. Because somebody, somewhere, sometime, is going to be suffering, that same suffering, and needs somebody who has suffered that suffering, who was able to tap into God by faith and receive comfort during that time of suffering. And he wants you to be a blessing to them. That's it. It's nothing about you. It has nothing to do with developing your faith or any of that stuff. It's just so you can learn how to always experience God's comfort. So this way, when someone comes your way who's had this thing, you can comfort them. And Paul said, that's amazing. It's amazing. I can't complain. I really can't complain about anything that I go through because he knows what he's doing. Somebody is going to meet me sometime and is going to need help. And so, Lord, thank you for your comfort. And then I get a cherry on top. I get to experience your comfort during my difficult time. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. What is this talking about? And what does this relate with what we're just talking about? Here's what it relates to. He says, guys, I'm very proud of you. And that's why I keep bragging about you. Because you have faith in your time of trouble. You have, you're able to stand strong in this. And that is helping others. Maybe that's the only reason you're going through. Yes, your faith is developing and it's growing. It's growing really, really, really strong. But God wants you to be a blessing to someone else. Guys, we are not to be cocoons. We're not to be little enclosed, isolated, insulated human beings. We're supposed to, whatever God gives us is not for us to stay with us. 
you know, sometimes you run into like preachers and stuff. It's like they have this. Have you ever gone to like a restaurant? Sometimes they have this like secret sauce. You know, have you ever seen that? So I, I didn't really experience it till one time when I was uh, doing research. And so the professor, he took us out to, um, to lunch. There was three of us, three guys doing the research. So there was a, a Romanian guy, a Vietnamese guy, and then he's, he's white and then um, Egyptian. So he took us three, four times out. One time he took us to an American place, and then the Romanian guy had to find a Romanian place. He paid, though. The Romanian guy had to, we were college students, starving college students. They were Romanian, and then the Vietnamese, and then I took them to an Arabic place. So I took them to an Arabic place, and then the guy is like, what is this sauce? I like it. The, the professor, I was like, wow, oh, no problem. So I asked the, the owner. So I tell the owner, hey, you know, I speak to him in Arabic. I figure, you know, hey, like, you know, come on, man, let's be cool here. So I got to impress this guy. He's my professor, you know, and he gives me the grade, and, you know, I'm getting paid as well. So... Um, What's the secret sauce? What's the sauce? He's like, no, I said, what is the sauce? He says, it's the secret sauce. I said, yeah, 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 I know to the, to the, to the non-Arabs, you know, but, you know, brother to brother, you know, what's the, what's the secret sauce? I can't tell you. <laughs> I was like, come on, man, give me the secret sauce. And he wouldn't let me. So I, I looked really horrible in front of the guy. I thought I could smooth, you know, be smooth, and I wasn't smooth. But sometimes people discover something in the Bible, and they think that only they discovered it, and they have this secret. And sometimes it happens with preachers. I run into it sometimes. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, wow, good job. Okay. Share it. Share it. But same thing, guys. We, as we live, and we experience how amazing God is and how he comforts us, share it. Share it with someone who's in need. Show them sincere love. Be there for them. Help them out. And that's what Paul said here. He says, listen, I received God's comfort in every tribulation. So that's way that we may be able to. I know that this is just going to be in my bank account. That I may withdraw it and give it to someone else. And be able to help someone else. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Because he is the God of all comfort. So it doesn't matter how many tribulations, all our tribulations. So in any trouble, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, they say, don't ask, ask someone. In, there's a saying in Arabic. It says, ask someone who's experienced something. Don't ask a doctor. For example, let's pretend a woman is going through childbirth. All right? And then I come as, you know, here's what will happen to you. And as a doctor, you know, and, and explain the whole process, right? So, of course, you know, the person will respect you because you're a doctor and so on and so forth. But my words will mean absolutely nothing if another pregnant woman who just had a baby tells the other woman something. Even if it's exactly the opposite of what I'm saying, even if it's wrong. They will believe the person who's experienced the thing more than the person. And Paul said, this is really true. A lot of times, you know, people will preach things. Not as effective. As when you, who have experienced God in that real thing that that person was preaching about, and then you share it with someone says, oh, now that makes sense. Now it clicks. Now you can be a source of comfort to me. There's a, um, a story that there was this movie star and this uh, um, preacher on a plane. I shared this before. Movie star and preacher were on a plane. And um, the preacher found out that the guy next to him was a movie star. So he was, he's like, kind of like, was really intrigued by, by movie stars, by actors. He says, listen, I, I'm jealous of you. And the actor's like, why? He says, because, see, I tell people the truth. They don't believe me. You tell people, you act out a lie, a made-up story. People cry and have emotions and believe you and be, talk about it for a while. Right? I mean, how many times do people walk out of church and talk about what they heard? And how many people walk out of a movie and, man, they can't stop for, like, weeks afterward, right? He says, I'm really jealous of you. And then the, the movie star answered. The priest says, oh, it's simple. He's like, what? And, and the priest's like, how do you do it? He says, it's very simple. He said, what is it? He said, see, I present fiction as reality. When I act it out, I act it as I believe it. 
But you, on the other hand, give reality as fiction. Sometimes it looks like you don't even believe it yourself when you're saying it. That's why people don't believe you. You see, people, a lot of time, we could talk big. Unless our life backs it up, our effectiveness and our, 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 uh, our worth goes out the door. But we need to walk what we speak. Then it becomes effective. You see, that's why people, that's what Jesus said. He says people will hate Christians. And they will hate them because they will, they're going to say, listen, you guys talk all this nice stuff. And then your life is exactly the opposite. You stumble me. I don't want to have anything to do with this. With this, there's a guy, I think it might, it might be Gandhi, I'm not sure, who said, if it wasn't for Christians, I would have become Christian. I love what the Bible says, but I just hate what the Christians do. So guys, I really pray that God will help us to realize the importance of the trials, having faith in the trials, to live that. And after we live that, and after we experience God's comfort, to share that with others and share it with humility with others. For as we, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so here he says sometimes we get all kinds of different sufferings, but there's some sufferings called the sufferings of Christ. This could mean a few things. This could mean suffering just because you're Christian, not because you've done anything bad. Okay, that doesn't count, all right? But the sufferings of Christ abound in us, a lot of it, but also some of the sufferings that can come uh, could be the type of sufferings that Christ experienced when he was here on earth. As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. It's okay. I'm still going to receive the consolation, the comfort, the encouragement, but it doesn't come from me. There's really no secret sauce that I have. It's through Christ. That's my secret sauce. That's where my power is. That's where I'm able to draw on through Christ. That's how this happens to me. So back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God, and I am able to speak about you guys and boast about you guys because that is going to be a blessing to others. That is going to be an encouragement to others. That is going to be what's captivating to others. That's going to be more powerful than my message. And then he said, among the churches of God, and he says, for your patience and faith. And here patience is talking about perseverance. Okay, so talking about you're under a lot of troubles Trials, pressures of life, and you're still long-suffering, still standing strong. Patience, and then you have faith. Not shaken, but trusting in God in all your persecutions. Every persecution. And we've seen here, God is coming at us in different ways because he's trying to develop us. One way he comes at us is persecutions, which means outward attacks. But if all he did was that, we would plateau. In our faith, it wouldn't get any stronger. So he says, no, I don't just do that. And also tribulations, which is pressures. Sometimes he'll bring pressures, pressures of life, financial pressures, time pressures, all kinds of different pressures and pressures and, tribu uh, and tribulations that you endure. And if you skip to verse 7, and to give you who are troubled, and here it's another, it's pressed into an narrow place where you're just so cornered. Different ways that God comes at us to develop that faith. And he does it so he can develop actually not just faith, but patience and faith in all the persecutions and tribulations that you endure. In Romans chapter 5, If you go, we'll go real quickly for verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. So here, now we're saved. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like, wow, this is pretty awesome. And this first section of chapter 5 is like, what's in it for me to be Christian? And he's like, whoa, that's awesome. Keep it coming. Right? Have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, does it get any better than that? He's like, yeah, let me tell you some more. Through whom also we have access by faith into the grace. Oh, man, this is awesome. So now not only do I have peace, I have access to the, uh, uh, to, into this grace by faith in which we stand. And I'm like standing right, and I'm like, whoa, the plot I landed in is called grace. It doesn't get better than that. 
And then he says, oh, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then I'm just like full of, I'm ecstatic, rejoicing of the hope that is, you know, meaning I'm going to be in heaven forever. And heaven is a, is a real promise for me. And it's going to be for eternity. And then he goes, and not only that, it's like, wow, what more can you give me? Right? When you say that, right? You have peace. You have glory. You have um, uh, rejoicing. You have hope. And he says, not only that, it's like, can you give me anything more? He's like, yeah, it, does, it gets even better. What? He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. You feel like, you know, it's like this like, really nice music coming. and then, Like, what did you just do? Like, you just killed my, you just killed my high, my excitement. My, like, you were going on a crescendo here. Why did you, like, kill it like that? Tribulation, glory in tribulation. You got, you got like, little problems? You need to see somebody? You know, it's like, who glories in tribulation? What's wrong with you? Right? He says, no, 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 I don't glory in the tribulation itself. I'm not crazy. But I look way past my bad problem right now. What do I look to? I look at what does this situation, what's the purpose behind it, and what's it going to do in my life later on? That's why I glory. Well, what does it do? Tell us. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing and this is, I'm absolutely sure of this, about this tribulation. That's why I can glory in it. I'm not crazy. I don't have like psychological problems. That tribulation produces perseverance. I know that tribulations are the weights for my faith to develop it. And then I have perseverance. I'm able to withstand. I'm able to have, be more longer winded. I don't know if you've ever done like a, an exercise, a new exercise. The first time you do it, you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> you know, it's like, Wow. Have you ever, there was a, uh, I'll tell you my toughest one I've ever tried was this. So there's this, the regular stair master, you know. It's a waste of a machine. It's four steps. It keeps going, you know. But it's, that one is not, is, I could do that one. But the, it's exhausting. Don't, don't get me wrong. But there's this other one that you stand on. It's like a stair master, but it's different. You, you go like this, and then depending on what you, the level you put, you sink really fast, and you got to be really fast. And it's like, <gasps> you, you, you feel like you're going to die. It's really good for the legs, though. So the first time I did that, I was like, and the machine, I tried to max it at the gym. And then you know they do it because they don't want you to hog up the thing. So they have a set limit on time on the things. For that one, it's 20 minutes. I mean, on the elliptical, you have an hour. And, on the, and they write the, the message, you know, don't take it for more than a half an hour if it's busy. But you can take it up to an hour. And same with the treadmill. But that one is 20 minutes. And I was like, what a joke, 20 minutes. I need 30 minutes of exercise. I put on 20 minutes, I stopped at two. And you just feel like you're going to die. But after a while, you develop stamina, and then you could do it, and you could go harder, harder. And you're like, you, look like, you look crazy on the thing, and then you can stand, and then you feel good. Same thing, he says, listen, I welcome tribulation, not because I love tribulation. I know it hurts. I know it's not fun. But I know what it does. I know that it's going to make give me perseverance, and that's what I want. I want to be long-winded. I want to have be able to withstand. I don't want to just be like, oh, two seconds, and I, I'm gone. That's lame. And not just that. And perseverance, character. He says God keeps going. He doesn't stop. So here he builds strength. And then from strength, he's like, I make you toned. I make you really beautiful. I give you character. And hear what it means, approved character. I give you my stamp of approval because you were able to glory in that which no one glories in. Because you saw the byproduct that it will do in you, that it's going to give you perseverance. And then that perseverance gives me the stamp of character, the approved character. And then character what? Hope. You have hope. Because you have that. Now you're like, oh. I could see things through his eyes, but I could also see the eternal perspective. I could see that this is temporary, so it doesn't need to get to me. In James chapter 1. Verse 2. <clears throat> My brethren... Count it all joy. 
if you fall into various trials. <clears throat> Did I read the verse correctly? Hmm? Yes. Let me read it again. My brethren, count it all joy if you fall into various trials. Thank you. What's the difference between if and when? When is just a matter, yeah, you will. It's just a matter of when, not if, okay? Sometimes we go through life like with the if mentality, like, Lord, I'm really scared, but if you bring it on, okay, but I'm scared, then please don't bring it on. But if you bring it on, if, 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 capital I, capital F, bolded, italicized, really big letters, if I fall into it, okay, you know what you're doing. No. Okay? When? No one is exempt. Period. And it's not just for believers. It's just for believers there's something that good comes out of it. My brethren... Feel it all joy. It doesn't say feel it because it doesn't feel good. But it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall, not into trials or some trials, but various trials. What this is saying, various, is the word for variegated, which talks about that our God is very creative, that he knows how he has trials in different ways. We've seen, in, just in, in uh, Second Thessalonians, right, we've seen persecutions, that's one way. Tribulations, another way. Troubled, another way. And he's got a lot more. He's so creative. And he's, he's, he's on a mission to build those muscles of faith. So he's going to come in various trials. So my advice for you, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Please count it like that. What does that mean when you count? What are you using? Are you using your brain or your emotions when you're counting? Both, I guess. I mean, are you really, like when you do math, counting is like math, right? Are you very emotional? Like, it's like, oh, three plus three is six. Oh, that was so awesome. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, right? So. Okay, fine. Considering you could use the mind and the emotions. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Here's what James is really saying. He's saying, okay, fine. Let's forget all this stuff. Let's pretend. Okay, so we've seen that it's when, not if, right? When you fall into various trials. So that means that it's going to come no matter what, right? We agree or not? Anyone here ever, never, 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 ever, 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 no matter how young you are, have been to a trial? Okay, you're not going to raise your hand. If you, if you raise your hand, you have no, you don't even know that you went through it, which is, might be nice, but, but we all have. So it's going to come anyways, okay? So James says, okay, if you think about it this way, let's say you pout about it. Did that make your trial go away? No. Did it make it feel any better? No, and even if it did, it's so temporary. That's it. How about if you complain about it? You might feel good, but eventually you're going to stop having ears want to listen to your complaining. You'll be like, oh, no, not again. So if you complain about it and if it makes you feel good, it's so temporary and after a while you're going to run out of people to complain to. If you pout about it, you only make yourself feel worse. He says it's coming anyways. So he says, why don't you just count it, consider it, calculate it, all joy. I want you to look at these things, not, oh, poor me, or what bad luck could have happened. But I want you to look at it, not as your enemy, these various trials, I want you to view them very differently because you see, outlook equals outcome. If I'm negative, I will always come out negative. If I'm positive, no matter how tough it is, I'm going to come out in the positive. So he says, listen, count it all joy. Instead of looking at the trial as your enemy, Embrace it as your friend. You can't feel it. It doesn't feel good. You have to look beyond this. You have to look a little bit above, a bit higher, and say, okay, this trial that came my way, here's, how, here's the mindset that James is trying to teach us. Who brought this trial in my life? 
You might say, God, you might say, say it. it doesn't matter because in the end, who allowed it? God. What's my example? Look at Job. Who allowed Satan? God. So who's behind it all? God. Okay, did it happen behind God's back? The answer is no. Is God out to get you? No. So if God is not out to get you and it came from God and God loves you and God always has a good purpose, do the math. Count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, again, he comes with this, he says, when it comes to trials, I'm always knowing. It's factual, just like we read in Romans. Knowing. And this is James and that's Paul. Knowing what? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. When you take that faith, faith that you talk about doesn't do anything. But that faith that is tested, you guys remember, faith that is not tested can't be trusted. So faith that is tested, and if if it passes the test because I calculated it, and I counted it, and I considered it all joy, guess what? It produces patience, perseverance. Again, the same thing like Romans 5. Perseverance. Now I have this, oh, I can withstand now. I have stamina. Spiritual stamina to face life. I don't have to break down like I normally would have or like others do. But let patience have its perfect work. And even patience, don't just say, oh, you have this much patience and I'm good. No, I'm not good to go. Take it to the next level. Let patience have its perfect work. Let it continue to mature in you. Let it get stronger and stronger and stronger. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Go for the ultimate. Say, Lord, I want to be in your likeness. That's going to take a lifetime until you're done with me. I don't want to make it a difficult job for you. I want to allow you to do it in my life. And I just submit to you in my life. In Hebrews 12, verse 11 Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. And that's, you know, obviously normal because who likes to get disciplined by by their uh, parents? And, you know, if you remember back in the days, you know, you guys are in one generation. Back in our days, you know, you get beat up. Here you get beat up. You say, excuse me, daddy. Excuse me, mommy. There's child protective services. You know, you don't, you got leverage. But back in our days, we got beat up. So no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Of course it hurts. It doesn't feel good. Even if you do the, the, the child protective services way of chastening, like I will ban you from this or that, it works still, right? And so here it seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It brings forth amazing fruit, peaceable fruit of righteousness. You become more godly in your life, but it's not, it doesn't happen to everybody, unfortunately. It says to those who have been trained by it. Meaning, I can go through a trial, walk out of the trial. Before the trial, I had zero faith. After the trial, I have zero faith. I can go through some chastening. Before the chastening, I was a level 5 believer. After the chastening, I'm still a level 5 believer. I can go to level 4. Worse. It's a choice that I choose to be trained by it or not. I can pout through the whole thing and not learn my lesson. And not have God take me to that next level with Him. That is our choice. God guarantees that he who starts a good work, he will complete it. But the thing is, I have to be willing. He doesn't guarantee that he's going to force me to learn my lesson. He he doesn't do that. Or else he wouldn't have created us as humans in the way that he's created us with free will. There wouldn't have been a tree of good and evil. Because that was by choice. He gave some human responsibility on each one of us. How are we doing? Where is our faith? Where is our patience? Where is our perseverance? Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. 
I'm going to stop here. I want to ask, which one is the one that maybe we need to come before God tonight and say, Lord, I want, I want to put this before you. Maybe it's the love. Maybe my love is stagnant. Maybe I need to come before God and say, Lord, I want my love to abound to everybody around me. Maybe that's not my issue, but maybe my issue is I don't live an exemplary life. Not an exemplary life that someone could boast about, the life that we live. Maybe that's what I need to put before God. Say, Lord, make my life, my walk consistent. Consistent that it becomes effective to people around me. Maybe that's not the issue. Maybe the issue is I don't have patience. I don't have perseverance. I break down too easily, too quickly before the trial that I have. Maybe that's what I need to put before him. Maybe my issue is faith. I don't trust God in my situations, in my circumstances. In my circumstances. Maybe what God wants me to do tonight is to say, Lord, I want to count it all joy. Lord, I want to know it's not just about me. It's that I need to learn to be comforted so that I can comfort others. If we can spend a couple of minutes in prayer, and if anyone wants to pray out loud.